Today we are talking about power to get wealth, part three. Power to get wealth, part three. And I'm taking my text from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18 to 20, and then chapter 9, verses 1 to 3. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18 to 20, and then chapter 9, verse 1 to 13. It reads, and I could, in fact, let's all read together, please. One to go. But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who is giving you power to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. It shall come about if you ever forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them that I will testify against you today that you will surely perish like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you. So you shall perish because you will not listen to the voice of the Lord your God. Chapter 9 verse 1. Hear, O Israel, you are crossing over the Jordan today to go into dispossessed nations greater and mightier than you. Great cities fortified to heaven, a people great and tall, the sons of the Anakim, whom you know and of whom you have heard. It said, who can stand before the sons of Anak? Know therefore today that it is the Lord your God who is crossing over before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and he will subdue them before you so that you may drive them out and destroy them quickly just as the Lord has spoken to you. Amen. I just want to lay emphasis on verse 1. The Lord said, you are crossing over the Jordan today. Let somebody shout today. Amen. Let somebody say today. Amen. The Lord said today, you are crossing over to, to, to the promised land to dispossess greater and mightier nations, nations and cities greater and mightier than you. He said, God said, you will overcome the sons of Anakim. You have heard about that, that they are great people, they are mighty, they are tall. But the Lord said, listen, child, my, listen, my child, I'm going before you. I'm going ahead of you as a consuming fire to consume your enemies before you. And I'm saying this to someone here today, that today you are changing levels, that today your story is changing, that today the Lord is going ahead of you to subdue every barrier, to remove Remove every limitation to overcome everything on your way, limit your progress. Today, that limitation is removed in the mighty name of Jesus. Today, you are crossing over. Say to your neighbor, I'm crossing over. I'm crossing over today. The Lord is saying today, not tomorrow. The Bible said today is a day of salvation. I'm not postponing my day of salvation. I'm saying today is a day that I am crossing over to possess my promised land. So God is saying, and I will go before you. God is saying, don't worry, my child. Yes, what you want to do, the visions, the dreams you have, the things you want to do, you feel that I cannot do this in my own strength. Yes, the Lord is saying, you cannot do it in your own strength. Because not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, see the Lord. So God is saying that don't think you can do it in, the, in your strength. For by means of strength shall no man prevail. So God is saying, I'm going before you. Say to yourself, God is going before me. Say to your neighbor, God is going before you. As a consuming fire to consume all your foes, to consume every barrier and limitations in front of you. This is my confidence that God has gone ahead of me. He said, I will make the crooked places straight. I will level the mountains. I will fill up the valleys. So God is saying the same thing concerning you today. Concerning that project. Concerning that thing that you want to do. God has gone ahead of you. And listen, it's a done deal. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Say to yourself, it's a done deal. Because God has gone ahead of me. We are talking about the power to get wealth. And last week we talked about four key words. We talked about power, we talked about wealth, we talked about covenant, and we also talked about remember. 
And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he that giveth the power to get wealth, so that he can establish the covenant which he swore unto your fathers. So we talked about these four key words. But today I want to touch on one. Let somebody say one. Just one key word. And that word is God. For it is God that giveth thee the power to get wealth. God is the source of the wealth we are talking about here. He's the one that will give you the wealth. The Bible says, unless the Lord build a house, the laborers, the labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen, they do what? They watch in vain. It is not by power. That song was, so, was just so in tune. The Lord is saying, it's not going to be by your power. It's not going to be by your might. It's not going to be by your credentials, not by your CV, not by your experience or expertise. I am the source of your wealth. I am the source of your progress. I am the source of your prosperity. So therefore, you have to rely on me. Amen. Amen. Now, we're going to look through the scriptures and see someone who made God his source. Because we're talking about God being your source here. He's the source of the prosperity. He's the source of the wealth. So if you remove God out of the equation, it is not it. You know, we have good success and we have bad success. Good success, and what is the difference between the two? The Bible says that this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, and thou shalt observe to do according to all that is written in this book, and then you will make your way prosperous, and then you shall have good success. So if there's what we call good success, it means that there's what we call bad success. What's the difference between the two? Good success is a kind of success that is in line with God's plans and purposes for your life. Bad success is the opposite. And so if they're going to get success or prosperous outside of God, in the eyes of God, it is not prosperity. That's what we call the prosperity of the wicked. Hello, somebody. And so we have to rely on God to give this prosperity. That's what we're talking about. So please turn your Bibles with me to the book of John. Chapter 5, verse 19 to 20. John chapter 5, verse 19 to 20. This is, Jesus, this is Jesus speaking here. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. But what he says the Father do, for, but what he says the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. Now the moment we realize that we cannot do anything on our own. The more we begin to depend on God. A lot of times we are depending on ourselves. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will do what? He will do what? He will direct your paths. Because the way of man is not in him. That's what Jeremiah said. The ways of man is not in him to direct his steps. Look at where you are today. Do you think it was by your own strength that you are where, where you are today? No, my, no, not at all. It's by his grace. Paul said, I'm who I am by the grace of God. So Jesus is said, saying, I cannot do anything on my own. Now, if Jesus could say that, God incarnate. Hello, somebody. The Son of God, the one who knows all things. If Jesus could say that I cannot do anything on my own, but the Father, whatever the Father shows me, then what are we talking about here? So we are talking about us fully reliant on God. If we read further, verse 20. Verse 20 says, For the Father loves the Son, and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Verse 21. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. Let me, let's pause here a little bit. 
Jesus is saying here that I don't just do anything and I don't do everything. It is what I see the Father do. That is what I do because the Father is my source. And why is Jesus saying all this? If you backtrack a little bit, the same chapter, verse 1, the Bible told us a man by the pool of Bethesda. This man had been there for 38 years. And this man was lying down there and, you know, and when the Lord, the Lord spotted this guy, the Lord located him. The same way the Lord is located someone here in this room right now to do you good. Hallelujah. So the Lord located the, this man and there were multitudes of people there. The Lord had the power to heal all of them, but he didn't. The reason why the Lord healed only the man that had been there for 38 years is because it is what he saw the father did. The father had gone ahead of him to heal this man, and so Jesus simply walked in there to heal him. What does that mean to us? It means that whatever the father has done, it's already finished. We all only just step into the finished works of the Father. That way we don't have to struggle in life. So Jesus just got there because the Father had already done it. So he just got, okay, let me just walk in the footsteps of my Father. And so he got there, the job already done, and told the man, get up and walk. Why? Well, because the Father has already done it. Amen. And so Jesus said, so do I, and this happened on a Sabbath day. And so they began to persecute Jesus. And Jesus began to explain to them that, see, it's not me that is working here. It is the Father that is working. And Jesus said, see, you haven't seen anything yet. The Father is about to do something. The Father will show the Son greater works than this. And he began to talk about raising the dead. So let us see the greater work that Jesus did. Because he said the Father will show him greater works than this. That all of you may marvel. So let us see the greater work that God showed Jesus, that Jesus did. If you go to the book of Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 43. It's a long read. Mark chapter 5, verse 21 to 43. When Jesus had crossed over again, into the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and so he stayed by the seashore. Now one of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up and on seeing him, fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Please come, lay your hands on her so that she will get well and leave. And he went off with him, and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. Take note, a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. In other words, a lot of this crowd were making body contact with Jesus. That's what that scripture is saying, body contact with Jesus. But as we read further, verse 25, now, verse 25, a woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years, had, had endured much under many doctors. She had spent everything she had and was not helped at all. On the contrary, she became worse. Having heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his robe. For she said, if I can just touch his robes, I will be made well. Verse 29. And instantly her flow of blood ceased, and she sensed it in her body that she was cured of her affliction. At once, Jesus realized in him, in himself, the power had gone out of him. He turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my robes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing against you, and you say, who touched me? And so he was looking around to see who had done this. In other words, Jesus was looking around. And then, and then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came with fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And Jesus said, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be free from your affliction. Can we read that verse in New King James Version? And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. 
go in peace and be healed of your affliction. I'm not sure which translation says, your faith has made you whole. Maybe King James Version. Now let's talk about this story first of all, because this is so interesting. I consider this to be an unscheduled miracle, because Jesus was going to heal Jairus' daughter. And as he was working, a lot of people were, you know, pressing on to him. And then this woman came with the issue of blood. And she said in her heart, if I I could just touch the hem of his garment, I would be made well. Now, this woman was acting contrary to the law. Because at that time, if you had that issue of blood, you are considered unclean. And whoever you touch or whoever touches you becomes unclean. And because at that point in time, she was about to break, to break the law. Because if, she, if they found that she touched somebody, she could be punished. But this woman said, you know what, I'm going to defy the law. I don't care what people think or say about me. I'm going for my miracle. I'm going to touch him and I know in my heart that I will be healed. So she was prepared to take that risk. I don't know how many people in this room right now are willing to take risk. Such that you will say, I don't care what people think. I don't care what the opposition is. I'm going to make that move. I don't care. I'm going to make that move. Listen, whether you act or you don't act, people will talk. People will castigate you. So the woman said, yeah, people may say staffs, they may castigate me, but listen, I'm going for this miracle. The only way to get people not to talk or castigate you is to play dead. Even when you play dead, even animals will not bite you. But would you choose to play dead so that animals will not bite you? Or would you say, I will get up and pursue my dreams? Even if I'm beaten by animals or people chat chat and talk against me, I'm still going for my goals. I don't know how many people in this room are that determined. Faith is about taking risk. Taking risk. Taking risk. Take that risk. The woman wasn't sure. She wasn't sure whether, I mean, she had faith in her heart that she would be healed, but the risk were there. But when she touched Jesus, Jesus knew that power had gone out of him. Now bear in mind that there were other many people, there were many people that were touching Jesus. But power didn't go out from Jesus to touch them. It's because these people were touching Jesus casually. They were touching him casually. But this woman had something in her mind that if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. Child of God, I want to say to you this morning that whenever you have the opportunity to come before Jesus, don't come empty-minded because if you come empty-minded, you will go empty-handed. Don't touch him casually. Touch him with expectation in your heart that, Lord, I want you to do this right now. Why? Because the Lord is here right now and the Lord is here to do you good. And so if you can touch him, the Bible says he can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He knows exactly how you feel. He knows the concerns in your heart. He knows the weight in your heart. He knows the pains and the struggles you are going through right now. So if you could only say, Lord, I just want to touch you. Lord, I just want you to heal me. Lord, I want you to take away this pain in my heart. As you are talking to him, he's reaching out to you. The Lord did not rebuke him for touching, did not rebuke her for touching him. Rather, she drew power from the Lord. And the Lord said, who touched me? It was an unscheduled miracle. They say when someone is receiving an unscheduled miracle right now, in the mighty name of Jesus, you never thought you could have it today. But listen, it's happening today. It's happening today. About that financial problem, about that health challenge, about that problem in your family, in your home, in your marriage, the Lord is reaching you right now in the name of Jesus and is bringing healing to you in Jesus' name. And so when the woman, after she had been, she been healed, the Lord said to her, when she came forward to confess to Jesus, the Lord said to her, your faith has made you whole. But remember, she had been healed. But the Lord said, your faith has made you whole. What is the difference? Remember, she had spent all her livelihood, all the money she had. She has spent on that disease for 12 years. So when the Lord says, your faith has made you whole, it means that all the livelihood that she has lost 
everything will be restored back onto her. Just as if nothing ever happened. Someone is receiving restoration here this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. Restoration of wasted years is being restored right now in the name of Jesus. Restoration in your finances. Restoration in your health. Restoration in your academics in the name of Jesus. Say, I receive it. I receive it. I receive it in the name of Jesus. Now, what God can do for one, he can do for another. Some people heard the story of this woman. And so if you go to the book of Mark, uh, I think the book of, um, the book of Matthew, I think, Matthew chapter 14, verse 35. If you go there, the Bible talks all about some other people heard this testimony. And the Bible says, as many that touched him, they were made whole. If you go to verse 36, uh, yeah, they were begging him that they might only touch the tassel of his robe, and as many touched it were made perfectly well. And that is why we give people opportunity to give testimonies. Because if God can do it for one person, he can do it for all. Hello, somebody. Is someone getting blessed here this morning? Shout hallelujah. Amen. Oh, thank you, Jesus. God is not a respecter of persons. He's not a respecter of persons. Now, after the whole episode, now remember, he was on a mission to heal Jairus' daughter. And I can imagine Jairus saying that, Lord, I came here on an emergency. My daughter is laying on the bed sick, about to die. And you are telling me that somebody touched you. Lord, don't you understand that I'm in a hurry here? This is an emergency situation. If it was in our current day, I would be in an ambulance driving me to Pool Hospital. But Lord, you still have time to be talking about somebody touching you in the midst of everybody, people around you touching your body. And I could imagine the guy becoming very uneasy and impatient. And then, all of a sudden, if you go back to the same scripture we are reading, Matthew, Mark chapter 5, let's go back to that story. Mark chapter 5, verse 35, verse 35. While he was still speaking, that is Jesus, they came from the house of the synagogue, uh, synagogue office, official saying, your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? Now I'm looking at this. I guess this man, and we, we, we I mean, let's be, let's, uh, let's apply some empathy here. If you were in the shoes of this man, or a lot of us are going through situations, or let them, let them say a lot of us, some of us may be going through situations where we feel or you, we think that God, why are you delaying? Why are you slow regarding my matter? The same way Jesus delayed and attended to that woman. And eventually the man got the news that his daughter was dead. Can you imagine what he'll be thinking in his heart? That Lord, you wasted my time. Lord, you wasted my time. You know, you wasted, my daughter just died and you are actually complaining about somebody touching you. What has that got to do with my daughter laying sick on the bed? And the guy could have actually missed Jan, pardon my, pardon my English. The, the guy must, could have actually said something wrong. But Jesus is just so cool. Hallelujah. If you read the next verse, the Bible says Jesus overheard what they said to this man. And then Jesus turned and said, do not be afraid. Only believe. Hallelujah. I want you to help me tell your, tell your neighbor, say to them, do not be afraid. Only believe. Why am I saying this? Sometimes we may experience delay in our lives. And you think that my biological clock is ticking. Time is going, Lord. I'm in my middle 40s, middle, in my 50s. I don't know where my life is going right now. It's as if things, in, I'm running out of time. But the Lord is saying to you this morning, do not be afraid. Only believe. Hallelujah. Say to yourself, I am not afraid. I believe in the Lord. So Jesus overheard. And he said, do not be afraid. Why? Because the God that we serve is never too late. 
Nothing is impossible for him. Impossible for him. The same thing happened to Lazarus. For Lazarus, you heard, and even delayed further. If you're experiencing delay right now, can I say this? It's for your good. He delayed further, and after Lazarus had died, he had been in the tomb for four days, and the Lord showed up. And the Lord said, Lazarus, come forth. It may look like your case is closed right now. It may look like you've reached the end of the rope. But I want you to hang in there. Because Jesus is never too late. Yeah. Jesus said to them, to the man, do not be afraid. Only believe. Let's continue reading. Verse 37. And he did not let anyone accompany him except Peter, James, and John, James' brother. They came to the leader's house and they saw a commotion. People weeping and wailing loudly. And they went in and said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but asleep. And they look at what the people do. They started laughing at him. At him. But he put them all outside he took the child's father, mother, and those who were with him and entered the place where the child was. And they took the child by the hand and said to her, Talita Kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began to work. She was 12 years old. At this, they were utterly astounded. Now, that was what the Lord was saying. He said, my father will show me something greater than this, and all of you will marvel. My father will show me that I will raise the dead. And indeed, the father showed him, and that was when the girl died. It didn't move Jesus, because the father had showed him that that will happen. Are we, are we still together here? One of the things that will build your faith is that if you can see things ahead, that's why we have the Holy Spirit. The Bible says he will show us things to come. And so for Jesus, no shaking at all. It doesn't matter what I'm going through. The Lord has shown me the end of the journey. See, there's light at the end of the tunnel. It's going to end up for my good. I know all things are working together for my good. So it doesn't matter what I'm going through right now. It shall end in praise. Hallelujah. Come on, make the devil go mad this morning. Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Make the devil go mad because what the devil loves is for you to keep that long face and be sad all day and feel depressed about your situation. But you can choose to say the joy of the Lord is my strength. I don't care what I'm going through right now. I know I will come out better on the other side. When the enemy thought they buried me, only they only planted me because when I am planted, I will come out better and bigger. Hallelujah. And so Jesus... Raise the dead, the, the dead girl, he raised her up. Yes. Now listen, when Jesus got to that place, look at what he said. In the midst of the commotion, in the midst of the wailing and crying and all that, he didn't join them. Rather, he said, the girl is not dead. She's only sleeping. Child of God, I want to say this to you. Do not use your mouth to cancel your miracle. Do not use your mouth to cancel your blessing. Do not use your mouth to cancel your promises. Rather, use your tongue to facilitate your blessing. Are we still together here? The Bible says the power of life dwells in the tongue. It doesn't matter what you're going through. Change it with your mouth. That's why God was angry with the children of Israel because they were always complaining. Stop complaining. Rather, speak positive words. Speak to that situation. Jesus said, and they laughed at him. Men may ridicule you, people may ridicule you, but look at what he did. He kicked all of them out. Some people must exit your life. You've got to kick negativity out of your life and remain positive in your life. Hallelujah. And then he did something. He took Peter, James, and John with him. People that will strengthen his faith. People that will, well, I don't think, you understand what I mean. Nobody can strengthen the faith of Jesus. But you know what I mean? Work with people that will strengthen your faith. Not people that will make you feel depressed. I don't need pitting party people around me. I want people that will build up my faith. That will speak life into my life. Into my situation. <laughs> Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Is someone getting blessed? 
Let somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Now there's something I want us to learn here. So the father showed Jesus greater works of raising the dead. And indeed, Jesus raised the dead. Remember, we are talking about the power to get wealth. And we are talking about God who is the source of the wealth. Now, Jesus said in John 14, 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than this he will do, because I go to the Father. So Jesus passed the baton to us. Greater works. In your finances, greater works. In your business, greater works. In your careers, greater works. In everything you do, greater works. Greater works than this. Now remember that Jesus took Peter, James, and John. Now let's look at how Peter walked in the full sense of Jesus. Acts chapter 9, verse 36 to 42. Acts chapter 9. Verse 36 to 42. Acts 9, 36 to 42. Now in Joppa, in Joppa, there was a disciple called Tabitha, which is translated in Greek called Dokas. This woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and, and charity, which she continually did. And it happened at the third time that she fell sick and died. And when they had washed her body, they laid it in the upper room. And since Lydia was near Joppa, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him, imploring him, do not delay in coming to us. I don't know whether those people worked with Jesus when he was going to heal Jairus' daughter. I don't know, maybe they were there. And they said, Peter, do not delay. <laughs> Verse 39, so Peter arose and went with them. And when he arrived, they brought him into the upper room, and all the windows stood beside, all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing all the tunics and garments that Dokas used to make while she was with them. But Peter sent them all out. Where did he learn that from? Come on, child, where did he learn that from? From Jesus. He sent all of them out. He knelt down and prayed and turned to the body said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes and when she saw, saw Peter, she sat up and he gave her his hand, raised her up and calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. Hallelujah. He simply just duplicated what Jesus did. I'm going somewhere with this. God is our source. Jesus is our source. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the perfecter, the finisher, the completer of our faith. And so Peter followed the full sense of Jesus. Now, if we go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, Ephesians 5, 1, it says here, Ephesians 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Imitate God. Copy God. Follow the footsteps of God. Now, because God is spirit, and most times we don't, in fact, I don't know if anyone has seen God here, but God walks through people. That is why Peter or Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1, he said, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. So we can see Peter and Paul imitating Christ and Christ imitated God. And so if Peter is saying, imitate me, then it means that in the kingdom, imitation is allowed. Hello. What I'm saying in essence is this. Do not try to reinvent the wheel. Imitation is possible in the kingdom. Now the question, remember last week, one of the things we said about the power to get wealth is understanding. One of the powers, or put it this way, 
one of the ways in which we can acquire wealth is through understanding. That was why when Solomon was asked, speaking to God, he asked God for understanding. And the Bible said God gave Solomon understanding like the largeness of the sea. And last week we showed, we saw from the scriptures, all the businesses that Solomon was doing. He had multiple streams of income. Remember the garden, the, the river in the Garden of Eden. The Bible says it parted into four river heads. Multiple streams of income. And the Bible says the river revealed the gold in the land. The river is the Holy Spirit. And you have gold. The Bible says these treasures are hidden in earthen vessels that the excellence may be of God and not of us. So there's a river, there's a river in you. There is gold or treasure in you. And the river of the Holy Spirit can reveal those. Now the thing is, God can show you things the same way he showed Noah. And I'm talking about finances now. I'm talking about business right now. The Lord can show you a field for you to walk in. However, for you to prosper in that field, you need to gain understanding. That's what the Bible says. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. In all your gettings, get what? Understanding. Now, we cannot see God. But God has put understanding in the hearts of men. The Bible says something in the book of Proverbs. The rich and the poor, God made them both. Not God made them so. Uh -huh. The rich and the poor, God made them both. Now, for those who are rich and who have certain expertise or skills, I believe that God has given them wisdom and understanding in certain fields. For example, in the days of Noah, Noah was the only person who knew God at that time. In my understanding, I may be wrong, but if Noah was not the only person, I don't think the other person or other people would not have perished. So the Bible said, but Noah found grace in the sight of God. Now, Noah was not a marine engineer. I don't think he was a marine engineer. But somehow God gave him the wisdom. And I don't think that Noah single-handedly built the whole ship. I don't think so. Somehow, he must have gained understanding from certain people around him. For example, how to make nails. Hello. How to cut wood. How to glue them together. And so on and so forth. There are people that God has placed around you that have understanding for world creation. Look for such people. If God has given you a vision to be a property developer, for example, you see that there are, there are businesses that you can do that can fetch you in one go. Millions. Hello. Hello sir. I heard the story of a woman she bought a house for, I think, two point, she bought a house for like 3.1 million, not her money, OPM, other people's money. She refurbished, she renovated, no, she only just got permit, planning permission, so she spent nothing less than, nothing more than 1,000 pounds. And that 1,000 pounds, I'm actually exaggerating. And guess what, how much she sold the property for? 4.5 million pounds. How much profit? There are businesses you can do that can fetch you millions. So I want us to begin to think about, I don't know what God has shown you, but the thing is, there are people around you that God has placed understanding in them. And you can learn from them. Including unbelievers. Let me say this, and let me be clear about this. How many of us are in the university? Well, I believe we all went to school, university or whatever. Now, the thing is, you can't say that because my lecturer is not a born-again Christian, I won't listen to him. Hello? You won't say that. But somehow, you attend the lectures and you learn from them. Similarly, you can't say because this person is a businessman because he's not born again, doesn't have the spirit of God, I can't learn from him. You can't. The Bible says the rich and the poor, God made them both. Whether they are born again or not, God made them. And so if something is working for them, find a way to get close. And yes, with them. And friend up. Yeah, friend up. People that, have, that are already there. Whatever field you want to be. There are people who are currently there. 
put it this way. Whatever you aspire to be, whoever you aspire to become, there are people already there right now. So pally up with them and learn from them. It could take you maybe a few months and then you learn the skills and you can command the world. All these things has to be around God because God is the source of this world we are talking about. I close with this. I was in a business meeting this past week and the man was talking, it was a business seminar and he was talking about how he made his money. He said he was, um, he said he got a quick notice to leave his uh, commercial property, uh, to leave his uh, rented apartment, business apartment. And he began to look for a place to rent. He couldn't find. And time was ticking. And so he went to this particular place, a club, club. And he said, he approached the landlord. The landlord said, yeah, he could rent it, but somehow he wanted to buy it. Did he have the money? No, but he said he wanted to buy it. The landlord said, no, I'm only going to rent this out or let this out. So he went to the neighbors, started speaking to the neighbors, and started saying that, guys, this place is a club. Are you guys happy with the club around you? And those guys said, okay, yes. If you're, no, that if you're going to buy the place and change it from being a club, nightclub, then we are behind you. So he got support of these neighbors, went to the landlord, as a landlord, see, these guys, they don't want this nightclub here. If the place is empty, it's going to take a long time for you to get a, someone. Eventually, he convinced the landlord to sell the place. He made an offer, the landlord agreed to sell. Did he have the money? No. So what did he do? He got a business partner. And he began to write proposal. He didn't know what he was doing. He was just putting, you no know, patch, patch, join, join, putting things together. He got to the internet, began to plagiarize images, put everything on the proposal. He completed the proposal, went to the bank, HSBC, Barclays, and all the banks, and guess what? All these banks were running after him. It now became like, you know, Drangos Den. He sat, and all of them stood in front of him, and they were presenting their own, you know, what they could offer. Eventually, he got the backing of the bank for a property worth almost half a million pounds. He got it, and he started renovating. Once he was renovating, he realized that he needed about 200,000 pounds more. He went to the bank, they gave it to him. Now the guy has turned the place to a serviced business apartment, and the guy is making serious money. Why am I sharing, sharing this? If the guy has said to himself, I don't have money, I don't think I should go for this, he would have remained. A lot of times we are waiting on God, waiting. But listen, God is waiting for you to act because he has given you favor. He has blessed you with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. All he wants you to do is to make that move. Say to about make that move. This person, well, I don't know whether he's a believer or not, but his story blessed me. The business only started in 2018 and the guy is making a big time. Say to about you can make it. You only just need to make that move. So right now, remember the, the task I gave you last week. Go to God and let God show you the field where you belong. Because the sin is this. If you don't, if you are walking in a field that God has not called you to do, to work on, you'll be laboring in vain. You have to locate, Pastor Olu was talking about this on Thursday, God's person. You, I mean, you have to be the right person. And you have to be in the right place. And it has to be the right period. And that the provision will come. And we sit together here. Yeah. Say to the God who is waiting for you. He's waiting for you to act. Yeah. 